I can observe my phenomena to be that some objects appear to float, some objects appear to sink, some objects will suspend in different mediums. My hypothesis is if I change the medium's density, the egg will move. Newton said if an object moves, a force is present. My null hypothesis is that if I change the if I change the density of the medium, the egg will not move. I will activate one of the hypotheses. My independent variable, my presumed cause that I must manipulate in an experiment, is the density of the medium. My dependent variable is the movement of the egg. I'll also try and keep everything else constant. The volumes of water, not no change, just the density of the medium. We can tell that the density of the egg is equal to the part in the glass where the, the liquid is. What I'm now going to try and prove is that if I change the density of the medium, I will cause the, the uh, effect by adding salt. So if I can change it, because I'm manipulating, I'm the experimenter and I'm manipulating my presumed cause, my independent variable is the medium, if that egg moves, I've caused it. We know the parts per million is about 300. All we need to do is pour some of this in. Hey, what do you know? The egg's immediately moved. Didn't have to wait for that, did we? So what's the cause? Well, scientific method states that the independent variable is the presumed cause, and I presumed that changing the density of the liquid would, with salt would cause a displacement. Newton's first law of motion states that um, f f every object will remain at rest unless acted upon by a force, and I've obviously created a force. The density of the medium has displaced the egg. The egg moved. Here's my 110 pound iron working anvil. I think we got this for making horseshoes and stuff, back when we had horses. So, I set it in here and see if it floats. Okay, it doesn't seem to want to stay upright. I'll just let it tip over. There it is. It's floating. <laughs> Look at that. The iron anvil floats because mercury has a density nearly twice that of iron. In fact, uh, due to the density ratios, the iron actually floats better than wood does in water. When I'm debating RDD versus gravity with Globers and I bring up a helium balloon, they always bring up a vacuum chamber. Then what's going to happen to the helium balloon in a vacuum chamber? Well, let's give it a look. Okay, helium balloons in a vacuum chamber. Three, two, one. Oh. Trying to turn it off right before they pop. Oh, that one fell. <laughs> See? Stop floating. And... Oh, they both fell. Look at that. So I'm surprised Globers even bring this up. Okay, so the pressure inside the chamber goes down, which makes the pressure inside the balloon go up. So it gets where it just barely can't support the weight of the balloon, and it drops down. But shouldn't it be able to levitate in there? Shouldn't it ease down like the way it does in air if it's displacing the air? So this goes against the gravity buoyancy model. And even if the helium did go to the bottom, which it doesn't, this doesn't hurt relative density disequilibrium because a vacuum is less dense than helium. So in my opinion, relative density destroys the globe, but this is the version I've been arguing for the most lately. When we reverse the polarity of the electric field and put a negative surface above a positive one, we can reverse this electrostatic phenomenon and get things to stick to the upper plate as if it were the ground. This works with all types of matter. You can move wood, iron filings, and even human hair with these forces. Believe it or not, you can even get water to bend. If the vector lines created between the two Gaussian surfaces are curved, all the matter will follow these field lines as well. In this demonstration, instead of using a flat plane, I use two circular objects as my Gaussian surfaces. You can see that as the water settles after being sloshed around by me turning the wheel on the Van de Graaff generator, it comes to rest with a curve in the surface following the electric field line. In this demonstration, I have a metal button hanging from helium balloons that keep the button buoyant just above the ground. By only adding more electrostatic potential to the button, you can see it will appear heavier 
and force the buoyant object down along the vector lines created by the electrostatic potential difference. Without changing the density of the medium or the object, one can change the overall weight or gravitas of the object. To do an actual experiment on the topic of gravitation, this variable of electrostatic acceleration must be taken into account at all times. This one for me was the hardest to really even look at because I've been fighting against motion for years and constantly, but I wasn't really considering weight. So I can't say that I don't feel weight. And um, you know, you got Rachie and Dell put together some good demonstrations and good arguments. So I I'm gonna discuss it. I'm not gonna get emotional. Hopefully everybody will follow suit. It's a good discussion. Right now, this van and everything in it is at rest. And we're gonna stay at rest unless we somehow accelerate down the road. Right. So that's what we're gonna do. Okay. We've got a, a passenger here who's, we've got Sarah in the driver's seat. Sarah, go ahead and just punch it, floor us. So we moved. We moved, okay. Way. All right, gentle stop, Sarah. And did you notice the balloon initially moved backwards? It did. Just like our bodies did, because we were actually at rest, but the van started to move and the seats actually collided with our bodies. So once, once the van caught up to us, then it started pushing us forward. So we're gonna see what happens though if we put a balloon filled with helium gas in front of us. It, we got pushed backwards, yes. essentially, but the balloon went forward. It did, it went forward. Okay. Goes forward. Uh-huh. Emergency stop, quick. Goes back. Wow. Pull so in there. It's just a really nice demonstration of what happens when you're in an accelerated vehicle. Okay. Um, there are these pseudo forces that appear. Like inside the vehicle, we feel like there's a force pushing us back. Sure. But for a person standing outside, they realize no, their bodies are at rest and the car is just slamming into so we observe the less dense objects go with the direction of acceleration. So this definitely destroys the globe's version of, of downward acceleration. Wow. The door is less dense in the water, and the water is pushing the door core, which is making the spring stretch. As he lets go of the bottle, the upwards force that was pushing the door core is now no longer there, and therefore the spring contracts. Again, he is holding the bottle. The nut is pulling down on the spring, which is making the spring stretch because it's more dense than the water, so it's going down within that water, and it's making the spring stretch. And when he lets it go, we can see that now there is no longer any weight to that nut. The weight is now gone. Even though it's still more dense than the water, it's no longer got that downwards force on it. So I believe this is Dell, and inside the container there's two objects. One of them floating, that's less dense than the water, and one of them sinking, that's more dense than the water. So on his final turn, he catches the two objects in transition, and then drops them. And he's demonstrating how, in free fall, displacement no longer occurs. So no matter which of these you're arguing for, I doubt you'll agree with this guy's explanation, but I thought it was a pretty cool demonstration and it's short, so I included it. Water is spraying out of the holes because gravity is pulling on the water, right? right yeah. But if Einstein is right, if I drop this bottle, the water will no longer feel gravity, so the water should stop spraying out. So let's see it. Three, one. What? Have you ever wondered what would happen if you tried to fly a drone in an elevator? Well, today I'm going to try it out. I'm, and then we'll try it from the ground floor going up also. Okay, okay now I'm going to actually try to keep it balanced. Going up. Okay, here we go. It's all the way throttled. Oh, I can't keep it up even all the way throttled. So if you'll notice, in the title I put potential constant upward motion evidence because with a question mark because um i'm not sure if the elevator is accelerating past takeoff because i see that he can't get it off the ground and so they could use this as an evidence if it's maintaining the same speed after takeoff so maybe this is something we could reproduce happen. I mean, most people, most students of physics would know that all objects on Earth's surface should accelerate down at the same rate, 9.8 meters per second squared. But in this case, what happens is the chain actually whips the weight around, so it accelerates at a rate greater than the acceleration of objects when in free fall. That's a pretty remarkable result. 
I want you to think about the bend in the chain. As the weight descends, the chain goes from falling to becoming stationary, so it's accelerating up. The tension required to accelerate the chain up actually pulls down on the weight, accelerating it at a rate greater than the acceleration due to gravity. So I realize I played this already, but it's just a little clip of it, and it's the last one. So also, I'm not sure if anybody knew this. I did not. And this is so thought provoking. Like this, I had to picture this in my head over and over, and I really wanted to discuss this, so I ended with it. Fear, you're falling through air, and if you're falling through air, then that air is hitting you, and it's pushing up on you a little bit. So you are actually feeling a little bit of gravity as the air is pushing on you. In fact, the interesting thing about air pushing up on you is when you reach your terminal velocity, when you're falling through the sky and you're not accelerating anymore, that's when you reach your terminal velocity. Actually, the air is pushing up on you with as much force as you'd feel as if you were just laying on the ground. So you're pretty much don't feel weightless anymore once you reach your terminal velocity. So when you fall out of the sky skydiving, you don't actually feel weightless. As